Welcome back to the Nebraska Shoot Around Podcast. I am your host, Jacob Badilla, and boy, what a difference a week can make. Uh, Nebraska, b- busy three days since uh, uh, Trev Alberts announced that, that Fred Hoiberg would be back, and it's looked like a completely different team. And joining me as always is my co-host, Jacob Bigelow. How you doing, Jacob? Hello, sir. I am doing well. I could not agree more with that sentiment. Um there has been a flipping of a switch of some kind. I don't know where that switch has been, what has been keeping that switch from being accessible since uh, November, but here we are. Um, there have been more road wins this week than there have been in the previous 35 months of the Fred Hoiberg era. So hey, give, here give we are. Again. Give that stat again. Uh, there have been more road wins this last week than there have been in the previous 35 months of Fred Hoiberg's tenure as the head coach of Nebraska men's basketball. <laughs> it's just mind boggling. <laughs> Crazy. But I'll give, uh, I'll give, and I'll give Dirk credit for tweeting that out too. I'll give, I'll give Dirk credit. Just, yeah. uh, just mind boggling in every, every possible way. Uh, even just the, even just the change in, since we last uh, saw each other in person, you know, at PBA on you know last Friday night against Iowa, I mean, yeah. we we talked last week about the three games in five days and how the you know could be could be something to worry about, and yeah, <laughs> somehow, some way, uh, somehow, some way, two games and <laughs> two games in three days, and State College and Columbus. Two wins by something. I just, yeah. What a difference a week, even two weeks makes just in the tune around this program and the results on the court, man. Yeah. And just kind of what stands out to me overall is about these last few games is we're finally seeing what we thought we were going to be able to see from these guys in terms of kind of guys fitting their roles and playing well within their roles. Guys were brought in here to do certain things and all season long, they haven't been able to do them well enough consistently to win games. And here we are, Latman knocking down shots in one of those games. CJ Wiltshire knocking down shots in every game. Trey McGowan's doing his glue guy thing, uh, locking up the other team's best player, make, uh, getting hustle plays, um, kind of <laughs> making a few chippy plays here and there. Uh, and Lonzo Verge making plays, whether it's scoring for stretches, whether it's making plays for others for stretches. Uh, and then Bryce McGowan's looking like uh, a, a first round draft pick. So we haven't seen that many guys, that many parts of the team click together in, in the same game all season long. And then it happens two games in a row. So I don't know uh, what, what's changed. We'll, we'll get into this a little bit here as we look through the games, but it's just finally playing like what they thought they could. They look a lot more like the, the, the team we saw play Colorado in the exhibition. It just took almost 30 games to get, to get there. Um, but let, let's go ahead and start with that Iowa game. Uh, and the final home game of, of the regular season, they honored seven seniors before the game. Uh, we, we talked about that a little bit on the previous, and uh, they, they went ahead and held their ceremony. And we'll see how, how many of those, if any of those guys come back next year. But uh, it, it was – and Fred Hoiberg talk, has talked about it like after the last two games. This is really the game where it started for them, where things started to click. They weren't able to get the win, but they played much better, uh, offensively at least. And final score was 88-78 Iowa. And it, Nebraska was down one at halftime after leading for much of the first half. And uh, Iowa got a, a layup with like a couple seconds left in the half to to take the lead. And then – they led throughout the second half. Nebraska was right there with them until an 11-0 run where Iowa was able to create some separation there where Huskers miss, uh, went 0-6 for 6 from the field with three turnovers and then to, to fall behind 69-56. And then that was basically it. But overall, outside of that one little 11-0 stretch, they went toe-to-toe with Iowa for uh, the rest of that game. And really the difference was guys that they were willing to – force to beat them, beat them. Tony Perkins, uh, career high, 20 points on eight to 10 shooting hit two threes. Um, and they just were not expected. He had some tough shots in there too. And that's a guy that 
just hadn't really been an offensive threat. And then you've got uh, Connor McCaffrey coming in and knocking down three threes uh, off the bench, scoring 11 points because they did a great job of keeping Keegan Murray in check, uh, finished with 15 points on six of 13 shooting three, seven from the line after he had 24 in the first half and a career high 37 in the game uh, against them the last time they played. And then Jordan Bohannon didn't really do anything until free throws down the stretch when Nebraska was fouling. It was only one of five from three. So they did a good job defensively on Iowa's top targets. They just got beat by the fourth and fifth option having a career games. Uh, but you look at the, the way Nebraska played, they had three guys or four guys in double figures. Uh, a lot of guys making an impact that shot over 50% from the field overall. So um, that 14 assists was 10 turnovers. So this was the game offensively that kind of, I think, kickstarted Nebraska's offense and led to the two wins that were to follow. Yeah, and I think this. I think the biggest thing that stood out for me about this Iowa game was, was it was a it was a very good uh, was a good Verge game. Yeah. It was a very good Alonzo Verge game. Uh, he finished with uh, he finished with eighteen on seven of twelve shooting to go along with uh, go along with I think he had seven seven assists. Seven. Yep. yep, seven, seven assists. assists five um, boards. Yeah, two and turnovers. He, yeah, he took advantage of uh, some, you know, advantageous uh, matchups with uh, Iowa's backcourt. That's how we'll put it. Um, and um, he had a pretty good game. Uh, the first half, um, you know, the first half was kind of rough for the uh, two guys that the multiple NBA scouts were in the building to mm-hmm. see uh, in Keegan Murray and uh, and Bryce McGowan's. Um, but Keegan, Keegan got going a little bit in the second half, still got up to 15 points. Uh, Bryce finished with 13, you know, just that, I think you said, you said something along the lines of, uh, you said something along the lines of this might've been the best we've seen from the McCaffrey brothers combined. They both kind of, you know, goes along with the theme of, you know, guys further down the scouting report, you know, having, like you said, having, having big games, when you can keep guys like Murray and Bohannon, you know, somewhat in check until Bohannon was shooting every free throw down the stretch in the second half, it felt like. Um, but yeah, I mean, just that run, that run killed them. I mean, they were they were going back and forth. I mean, the fact that Iowa probably had their worst half of the season and still had a halftime lead was pretty telling about what the final result was going to end up being. But but in, all in all, not uh, not incredibly you know discouraging considering they got ran off the court in Iowa City the, when they played the last time. Um, I, I'd say probably the most interesting you know thing that we we saw and you know witnessed firsthand was. Uh, with some post-game comments from the point guard and from, and from Derek Walker. Um, and we don't have to spend too much time on it, but obviously, you know, the day after uh, Trev's announcement that uh, coach Hoiberg will be returning and, and they didn't, they didn't hesitate to, you know, to go to bat for their head coach. Um, Alonzo cut Derek off in yeah. the middle of, of him talking to say, you know, sorry to cut you off, bro, but you know, I'd, I'd play for, I'd play for coach Hoiberg any day. He's a hell of a coach. And, you know, that's, that's pretty telling coming from a guy who's had the, who's had the year that Verge has had. Yeah. And you can go on hillvarsity.com and uh, I kind of wrote a story on those comments and Fred's uh, reaction as well. Um, got the full comments there, but you're right. Like uh, it was, uh, Derek was, is kind of pretty measured. Uh, he was uh, kind of thinking out like how we wanted to say or whatever. And, uh, and then, like you said, uh, Verge just like cut right in. It's like, hey, he's a, he's a great coach, and kind of pointed out like, hey, he's he's so detail oriented. He, uh, he he always he prepares you for every single game for whatever is going to come, all this type of stuff. So uh, he he spoke up pretty uh, uh, pretty strongly in favor of the guy that's coached him for less than a full season now, and he talked about kind of the growth that he's made as a point guard playing for Hoiberg. And um, how, though they didn't get the wins this season that he was hoping for, that uh, he felt like he got what he needed from this year on that front in terms of coming to Nebraska. This is what he came here to be, to be a point guard uh, and to get a chance to run his own team. And he credited Hoiberg for uh, his growth in that area and helping him understand the game better and see the game better. And it hasn't always, obviously, Nebraska fans listen to this, you, you know, it hasn't always been smooth out on the court this year. Um, it's it, but there have been stretches of really good play from him. And we saw these last three games, for the most part, 
there's still some shot selection issues and there's still um, him trying things that he can't quite finish at this level against the, the size and athleticism with his own physical traits and the fact that he can't use his left hand. Um, but <laughs> overall, um, he, he spoke very highly uh, of, of Fred and um, he won't be back next year. Derek could be back. Um, we don't know yet, but uh, I, I think you're right. That was definitely worth mentioning and touching on. And you talked about the slow start from Bryce. Uh, the first, the start of that second half, I think, was um, really impressive. And he scored nine of Nebraska's first 11 points of the half and knocked down a catch and shoot three in the corner, I believe it was. And then outside of that, it was basically just going to the rim. He made a few really impressive moves to draw fouls. Uh, a lot of free throws there to, to start the second half. So he didn't have a great game overall, but that start, the, uh, the, the first five minutes or so of the second half, um, definitely put some good stuff on tape for the the NBA scouts that were there. Absolutely. And uh, you talked about, uh, I mean, we can transition to the next game. Obviously, yep. you know, they, um, after a late late Friday night tip against uh, against Iowa, they had to get on a nine a.m. nine a.m. flight the next day to go to uh, everyone's least favorite Big Ten road trip uh, out to Penn State. And like we said last week, the the sight going into this game of Fred Hoiberg's lone uh, lone road win as head coach prior to this week, um, and they just came out and they handled Penn State from wire to wire. Um, 20, I mean, they, they were, I don't even, I don't remember the exact shooting percentages for the first half, but I mean, it felt like, I mean, it's yeah, crazy. I, I, I that, it. It's crazy that at this point in the year, you know, we keep just referring back to, to an exhibition game that didn't count, but like, I mean, it's, it's the point of reference that we have for them playing the way we thought they would play. And this, this, <laughs> this was the closest, this was the closest we'd felt to that for sure. I mean, they, I mean, just felt like everything everything was going right for Nebraska on Penn State's Penn State's last home game. Uh, it just a just I just a wild. I mean, this is a wild box score to even look at multiple days later. But yeah, uh, that was a ninety three to seventy win for Nebraska. Uh, you can get into the numbers a little bit. Yeah, you mentioned the first half they shot sixty point six percent from the field, including seven of twelve from three. And put up 49 points, which I believe is the most in a uh, uh, half Nebraska scored against Big Ten competition or something like that. I forget the exact stat, but um, something that we haven't seen from Nebraska in the Big Ten is 49 points on 60% shooting with seven threes, uh, just five turnovers. They they were just shooting the lights out. And he's, uh, Verge was in double figures. Uh, Bryce was in double figures. Derek Walker was in double figures. Uh, all five starters had multiple buckets. They didn't have any bench points, but they didn't need them because uh, the starters were playing so well. Um, so that in this, we, we talked about early in the season where kind of felt like if, if shots would just start to fall, things would click. And uh, it, we were, we proved that that wasn't necessarily the case because shots did fall a little bit better uh, and they weren't able to sustain it even in the games when they did shoot a little bit better and they were still struggling others of the game. But in, in this one shots did fall and Nebraska was able to pick up some momentum. They were feeling good and it continued the rest of the game. They never real. there was one stretch in the first half where they turned the ball over, I think four out of five possessions, but then Bryce came down and, uh, knock down a pull-up jumper from the elbow to kind of get them settled again. And they pretty much cruised the rest of the game. There was, uh, I, I forgot the runs exactly, but they kind of, it was some, maybe like an 11-0 run or something like that to open the lead and then gave up a bucket, then like a 7-0 run, uh, something like that, um, where this really opened that game up in, in the first 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes of that game and then controlled it fr- from start to finish from there. And in the second half, Shots just kept falling. Like this is a game where, like, well, seven to twelve from three, Nebraska's going to have to find a way to um, kind of keep scoring in other ways because that's probably not going to happen again. Well, they went six for eight from three in the second half. So, uh, yeah, thirteen for twenty from three in a regulation Division One basketball game, which I did not 
did not think that this team was capable of that after watching how much they had struggled all season long. And it really was everybody. Um, I mean, every, everybody but Keon Edwards, who checked in and played uh, the last three minutes of the game. Uh, everybody who took a three made uh, made the three. Uh, Alonzo Verde Jr. was two for two. Trey McGowan's was one for one. Bryce McGowan's was three for five. Lat Man was two for five. And C.J. Wiltshire was three for three. And Kobe Webster off the bench was two for three. So you had guys just knocking down shots. And everybody was feeling good. The ball was moving. Uh, Bryce was getting some some good situations where he could attack and uh, get to the basket. Uh, he scored on all three levels in that game. That, that was, uh, in terms of overall scoring, uh, I think that game was probably as good as we've seen from him up to that point all season long. Finished with 25 points on 8 of 13 from the field, 3 of 5 from 3, and 6 of 6 from the line. So, um, again, scored in basically every single way possible and did it efficiently. Uh, and then he got help from everybody. Let me in, 13 points, 5 of 8 shooting. It was his first uh, – it was a season high for him. Uh, I can't remember, maybe first or, or second double-digit game of the season, which is kind of a crazy stat considering what he was last year, uh, that he couldn't even get to double figures – uh, multiple times this season, but you had Verge with 15, five assists, just three turnovers. You had Trey with 12 points. That was his first double digit game. Also, four assists and five rebounds and no turnovers. Um, and, and then Derek Walker kind of doing his thing, chipping in 10 and seven. So, um, everybody, everybody played their role, everybody did what they were supposed to do, and that they just absolutely dominated a Penn State team that. Obviously, is it one of the best in the Big Ten? But they made them look much worse than they were, and probably wasn't uh, cool uh, of BTN to keep showing John Hara and uh, how how much that <laughs> that game was bothering him, considering it was his last home game at Penn State uh, for a dude that's had a long and uh, productive career there. He was very emotional, and they just kept going back to the the camera shots of him in the huddle, him on the bench as Nebraska continued to rain threes on them. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, uh, was a little much. Uh, didn't know, did, didn't know I was watching, you know, a CBS sad crowd shot montage. Uh, that's what that kind of felt like the repeated, uh, showing of, of John, Her- John, is it Herrer, Herrar? I've heard, I've heard both, but, yeah. um, but yeah, just a complete and total, perf- you know, complete performance start to finish. And then, uh, you know, there was there, you know, a road win at Penn State. You know, they've won there before. Maybe that didn't move the needle for you. How about a road win against a ranked team? <laughs> how, about, yeah. how, about a ro- how about a road win against a ranked team? How about First. doing, how about, you know, this is a cherry pick, but how about doing something that Duke couldn't do and winning <laughs> at the, and winning at the Schottenstein Center <laughs> in Columbus, Ohio? 78 <laughs> 70, the final um did not know what that arena was called um that's what i'm here for man that's what i'm here for some people call it value city arena but it is value city arena at i think the complex the entire building is called the the schottenstein center or something something along that those lines i think but uh that is the name and the nebraska goes in and uh just a back and forth first half you know the old you know the classic adage of you know basketball is a game of runs but i mean after you know after two game after the two games prior you could assume you know maybe nebraska's tired ohio state for lord knows what reason was favored by 15 and a half points in this game um and this just this just made me think of you know I mentioned it earlier, but this made me think of, you know, the stuff that the stuff that Verge was talking about after Iowa, about how they don't know how to respond when they get punched and when they get knocked down, they don't know how to get back up. And this was a game where they were going punch for punch with Ohio State. Um, And even even when it got a little, you know, kind of shaky down the stretch, they still found a way still found a way to finish and uh, and get a big road win in a game where Derek Walker only played 13 minutes. Yeah. I, I tweeted that after the game, after I realized that like that, that might've been the most surprising part of that game, considering 
the way that this season has played out and how foul trouble to to Derek has typically meant, uh, yeah, this night's going to go poorly. We saw that uh, in the Purdue game and, and others. And he actually – he was the guy that got off – um, he finished with four points, but both of those were basically right away. Got him off to a good start, um, two early buckets uh, to get them going, and then didn't score – Again, the rest of the game uh, finished with four points, five rebounds, and four fouls in 13 minutes. Uh, but credit to him, he was the guy late um, that matched up with EJ Liddell on the perimeter and didn't fall for the first fake, stayed down, and then got up and contested Liddell's three that would have uh, cut Nebraska's lead down. Uh, what, were they ahead by four or something like that at that point? I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. I think it yeah. might have been five. I think it might have been five because yeah, just five, like yeah. the first time they played, they were up by five with 36 seconds left. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but no, no meltdown this time. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was uh, 74 69 at that point. So a three goes down there with 38 seconds left, and suddenly Nebraska is feeling the pressure. And we've seen what has happened to Nebraska when they felt pressure this season. Uh, multiple times now, so Western Illinois, NC State, uh, time and time again. This Ohio State game last time um, where they had the lead, uh, and that was kind of in the back of my mind as I was going through because you were feeling good about the way they were playing the entire game. Um, but you also had the, uh, in the back of my mind as well, they were up uh, whatever they were up in the second half last time too, and that ended up going to, to overtime where, they, where the Buckeyes kind of handled it. So you never felt too secure. Uh, uh, in, in this game, uh, up until um, the, the very end, last twenty seconds, or so and they're like, "Well, wow, they're actually going to do this." Yeah, I mean, like I like I said, um, you know, from where we were, you know, less than two weeks ago, where it was kind of all but assumed they were going to lose out. Uh, it was kind of was just like, "Well, they're not going to win a game the rest of the way. We'll see what." the decision on Fred is and you know, we'll go from there. Um, you know, these two wins obviously don't change the previous 28 games before them um, does not probably change, you know, any of the questions going into the off season. But, you know, as I, as I said on Twitter last night, after everything that, you know, these guys have, you know, endured, been through, you know, the tough results, the, just everything from start to finish uh, to see them being able to celebrate in that locker room last night, jumping up and down, being happy. I mean, you gotta, you just gotta, you gotta be happy for those guys uh, no matter what. Um, and, and, you know, Fred Hoiberg in the, in the locker room post game, you know, he, it's one of my favorite corny coach speak sports adages of why not us? And I don't know why that wasn't their mantra the entire season, but um, you know, no time like the present, I guess. We'll see. We'll see if they can, if they can, you know, continue some, dare I say it, you know, dare I say something I didn't think was possible less than two weeks ago, some positive momentum of some sort with one regular season game and then a trip to Indianapolis for the big 10 tournament left on the docket. Yeah. And, you mentioned kind of back and forth in the first half. Nebraska held a lead for much of it, but it was a four-point game at halftime. E.J. Liddell comes out, hits two free throws to start second half, cuts it to two on the very first possession, and drew Derek Walker's what, third foul at that point, uh, sent him right back to the bench on the very first possession of the second half. Um, and then Bryce put the team on his back, and they went from up two to up ten, uh, in the span of a few minutes with Bryce scoring uh, a, a lot of those points himself. He had, he had a, a two dunks in there, yep. uh, two dunks in there, and then a, a, a jumper to, to, to push that lead to 10, um, kind of give them their first double-digit lead. And he was special once again. Um, look, overall, he finished with t- 26 points on 8 of 15 shooting, only 2 of 7 from 3, but 8 of 9 from the line. And um, – going head-to-head with uh, Malachi Branham. We'll, we'll probably talk about kind of the freshman of the year race a little bit later on. And after Branham lit them up uh, and demolished them with 35 points in the previous game, that was kind of his coming out party, uh, finished with 16 on 5 of 11 shooting um, and fouled out in 33 minutes, three turnovers. So, um, I mean, still solid game, but not the kind of game where he 
dominated like he had previously. And a lot goes to Trey McGowan's defense for that. Fred Hoiberg especially made sure to mention that. But um, you, you saw two best freshmen uh, in the conference this year uh, go head to head, and Bryce definitively won round two. Um, and he he got some help from Burge, who first half uh, set a program record uh, for with nine assists in a half. Um, th- nobody's ever done that in conference play before against a conference opponent. And so in the first half, he was dishing the ball around all over the place, nine assists, just one turnover. And in the second half, they went through a stretch there where um, they were, Ohio State was staying home. Uh, they liked their matchups, and he kind of took over, and he just went uh, – I forgot how many points he scored in a row, but – he was going. Uh, it, it was all him um, when Ohio State was trying to trying to get back in uh, into the game. And yeah, he uh, he saw a guy who makes TikToks get switched onto him, and he uh, and he he uh, probably smiled a big uh, big ear to ear grin, and he took full advantage. Um, there it is. Know. It was a nine to four run. Um, yep, that <laughs> took a, a six point game uh, and made it an eleven point game, and. <laughs> He hit a three in the air and then had a, uh, you know, the rest was all at the rim, I believe. Um, and so th- that was a huge little stretch there where, again, Ohio State had a chance to get back into it. Uh, and Nebraska pushed the lead to, to 11 with three and a half minutes to go. It kind of, uh, he kind of got a little <laughs> carried away after that because they did a much better job in keying in on him. I think he got blocked once or twice and yep. took a couple tough shots. So, it got away from him a little bit there, but that was still an incredibly important stretch and nobody else was kind of stepping up. So he's like, all right, my time, I'm going to go get some buckets here and they need in the worst way. And he delivered. So he finished with 13 points, uh, five, uh, five to 14 shoot in. So not, not super great there. Um, four, 12 inside the arc. And I mentioned the tough part about him is he, one, he, he doesn't, he uses his right hand no matter where he's going to finish. And that's where you get a lot of those tough, um, like contested, uh, shots around the basket that he has trouble finishing. Um, but still finished 13 points, 11 assists, just one turnover and five rebounds. So he showed you he could carry the team with his passing, could carry the team with his scoring uh, and did enough in both areas, depending on what the team needed at that particular time to, to get them the win. And then the other guy that we need to mention is CJ Wilcher, who uh, yep. just lit it up particularly in the first half, hit his first four shots. Um, and with Derek Walker, Latman, and Eduardo Andre all picking up two or three fouls in the first half, they finished the half playing five guards where CJ was the de facto center. Um, and he held his own. Like they, they did well enough those lineups to, to get into halftime with the lead. And then they turned to it uh, for stretches in the second half as well, whether it was Lad at the five with CJ at the four or CJ at the five with four other guards out there with him and finish 15 points on six, 11 shooting. And he was three of five from three. Uh, he had a couple, he had a really nice like drive and spin move for a layup. And then also scored on another layup um, as kind of a zone beater um, where they, they caught him or got the ball to him down low when he went up and finished. So showed off that I think he had a mid-range jumper as well. So kind of showed that he's more than just a spot-up catch-and-shoot guy. But um, just kind of looking at the the trend of these three games together, you look at CJ during that stretch and averaging 12.7 points on 64% shooting, uh, including 8 of 12 from three. That's what they brought him here to do. Absolutely. (laughs) He is doing it at an incredibly high level now. And those were some of those. It's not like he's all getting wide open. All right, set your feet. He is hitting some tough shots. A lot of their actions are kind of uh, like screen, uh, the crack back screen, run away and then come back like on the move. He hit hit that one in transition um, where it was kind of a tough look. And um, so it's not like he's shooting all like the easiest threes. He's hitting some tough ones as part of this. And I, I'll tap my it um, got it here to see him kind of what he is shooting overall now. Um, but on the season, he is up to 43% from three in conference play. And he's uh, second all time in, in three pointers by a freshman behind Joe McCray, who he is not going to pass because he has a 30, 33 lead right now. 
Uh, yeah, Joe McCray, I think, uh, I, think I, I think I think Husker Hoop Central put it best last night. It was fitting to see uh, CJ paying homage to Ryan Anderson by being a guard playing the center uh, <laughs> after after he passed him on the three point makes by a freshman list last night. Um, other other movements up the charts that happened because of that game last night. Um, after Alonzo Verge's eleven assists, he moved past uh, some guy named uh, Teron Liu for sixth place. Um, in a single season assist leaders, he's up to 154 on the season. Um, and uh, even on the three point makes by a freshman list, uh, there's two guys from this year's team on there with CJ now in second and Bryce McGowan's down in eighth. Um, I realized that last week we did not mention Bryce's more significant record breaking um, achievement. He moved past uh, Dave Hoppen for most points in a single season uh, by a freshman in uh, program history. And um, he's, I think now he's, I think he's over 500 points for the year. Um, it's pretty impressive. And uh, so even with, uh, even with the, uh, even with the win loss record being what it is, there's still going to be some guys whose names are in the old, uh, in the, in the old record book for, for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. And Rice, what, seven, seven time big 10 freshman of the week. Um, yes. Heading into this week. Uh, pretty, obviously, I think a lot of fans are, Oh, it's a foregone conclusion, big 10 freshman of the year. There's no question about it. Uh, Malachi Branham was coming on strong heading into this week. Um, and he was uh, averaging about 15 points a game in conference play, shooting 48% from three, 51% overall, 82 from the line, um, and doing it on a top 25 team. So depending on the way that the voters – consider this award and what they they view do you look at conference play only versus overall do you look how much do you factor in winning versus not um but Branham has a legitimate case like I, I don't think anybody else in the conference went through it um Max Christie he just Caleb Houston uh neither one of those guys those are and the Musa Diabati those are the three guys rated ahead of uh Bryce McGowan's uh, in terms of the 24-7 composite recruiting rankings, those are three five stars ahead of him. Um, none of those guys have been good enough to to actually be in, in the race. Um, obviously, we got we know what Bryce is doing, and then Chucky Hepburn is another one of the uh, just a handful of starters uh, as true freshmen point uh, in the conference this year, and just hit that game winner uh, to lift Wisconsin past Purdue and clinch at least a share of the Big Ten title this year with a team that I did not think was capable of doing that. Uh, yeah. Picked uh, pick 10th in the preseason. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting to hear uh, Jess settles uh, during the broadcast of the Penn state game. Uh, remind the people that he won big 10 freshman of the year while playing for a last place Iowa team in the 1993 and 1994 season. Uh, you know, given that was you know some time ago but it we we were kind of wondering for most of the year what's the what's the lowest the teams finished in the standings that you know some somebody's won big 10 freshman of the year uh, it was interesting to hear that <laughs> that there has been a freshman of the year on a last place team before um uh, but we'll, and then uh, obviously you know walking off the court last night you saw trey putting the invisible crown on bryce's head uh, Bryce went on an Instagram live wearing sunglasses in the locker room and just heard Trey say again and again, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Uh, didn't take Trey to be a big Shakespeare guy, but um, here, here we are. <laughs> um, so we'll see how that's uh, what the, that'll get announced on Tuesday. I think the day before the conference tournament gets underway. Uh, so we'll be able to, react to that next week um i i yeah like you said i think branham is probably the only other guy who's got a legitimate case um to... and, and I, I went into this week i was planning to write about that for my wednesday column anyway and uh i was planning to write it like just like hey nebraska fans uh be ready for this uh there is a legitimate case here for branham to kind of swoop in and steal the award and heck 
even today, uh, we, as we record this on Wednesday night, Andy Katz named him Branham his Big Ten freshman of the year and pointed to doing it for a winning team, which – uh, I don't think that typically factors in as much as it does for other all-conference awards in terms of the, the team that you play for and how successful you are just by the, the nature of you don't often have a ton of freshmen on winning teams that are, unless they're like the, the true five-star uh, top five type of guys, like a lot of times, especially in the Big Ten, you don't get the, the best yep. the best recruits coming here. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah, I was going to say, um, I think that's, that'd, be, that'd probably be more of a player of the year uh, yeah. you know, consideration, which is going to, which is going to be an interesting race in and of itself in the big 10, yeah. I think. Um, but yeah. So, but, so coming into that game, I was like, well, if, if Branham has a big game here and Ohio state wins, then this thing very well could shift in, in his direction. And then Bryce comes out and outplays him and Nebraska wins. And again, Bryce 51 points on 58% shooting in the previous two games. Uh, just scoring in every single way possible uh, and leading his team to, to a pair of wins as the unquestioned number one option. That's kind of the, the difference is Branham. He's been much more efficient than Bryce has, but he's also playing next to an all American and player of the year candidate in EJ Liddell. Whereas every defense of scouting report is focused on Bryce first, second, and third. And then you can start worrying about Verge and Derek and these other guys. So, um, I think we, we talked a couple episodes ago, I tried to put into context kind of the season that Bryce has had and pointing out that yeah, actually, while he's only shooting 40% from the field and 28 from three, it's actually more impressive than kind of just the raw percentages in terms of he's taken a lot of hard shots because nobody else can, can read on the team. And um, so like he, he's doing as well as you could possibly expect from a player in his situation uh, at his age and his um, uh, just kind of where he is at a play as a player now. So um, I, I kind of went into that game thinking, Oh, this is up for grabs. And then with the way that Bryce came, I'm like, it kind of felt like he should have locked up the award in that game. We'll see. Ultimately again, you never know what voters are uh, going to value. We know, Katz doesn't get a, a vote in it, but um, his if he did have one, it would be going for Branham. So, um, so don't be shocked. We do it, know we do know for sure that Bryce will not be getting a vote from Chris Holtman. We did <laughs> yeah. we did learn that um, Bryce McGowan's does not have the vote of Chris Holtman, and, much and that to was the chagrin. Yeah. Of, uh, <laughs> and that's what kind of triggered the idea to uh, it's like the the column is like seeing just the response from the Nebraska side of that where. Um, well, yeah, I mean, his guy's got a legitimate case, so it makes sense why, of course, he wouldn't be voting for Bryce. But, um, yeah, I, I feel like he probably should have locked it up with that performance and the way he's played these last two games in, in particular. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, closing, closing out the season strong, looking like uh, the guy that we thought Nebraska uh, was getting. And as a result, you've got Bryce playing like a star. You've got role players filling their roles and you've got Nebraska winning games uh, two in a row here. Yeah. So for the first time all year, we tried this at the start of the year, but there wasn't much to talk about. <laughs> we asked for Twitter questions because yeah. there is, because now there are things to ponder and think about and consider <laughs> after, yeah. after back-to-back road wins and, uh, Thankfully, we got some uh, responses to your yeah. tweet last night I, asking I was, us for questions. <laughs> I, I was yeah, I was pretty hesitant to to put out the call previously because I figured it would all either be sarcastic responses or questions that we probably didn't want to answer, <laughs> um, or just or just uh, is Fred back? <laughs> it would have been yeah. a lot. Would have been a lot of is Fred yeah. back? How do they bring Fred back? And things of uh, things of that nature, but. Uh, after last night, you put out the call, and uh, we got we got some answers. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll so, go ahead and start here. Yeah, um, go ahead. So we'll start here with a uh, good friend, Dustin Huber. Um, shout out, Dustin. Great follower. Um, love talking hoops with him. Does having Trey back and fully healthy translate to these wins, or what do you think is the reasoning? And I do think Trey has been a huge part of, of these games, and – He's finally kind of gotten back into a rhythm, I think, coming off of the broken foot and missing so much time 
you could see it just wasn't there. Like how Lucy, what the ball handling was um, just kind of standing in the corner. A lot of times still trying to figure out where he belonged in the offense. Um, and he just kind of wasn't a part of it. And these last three games, it's not like he's scoring 20 a game, but um, he has scored nine, 12 and seven points in the last three games and has done it on 65% shooting. He's three of five from three during that time. Four assists, just one turnover at eight steals, um, 14 rebounds. So he's doing a little bit of everything. He's making good decisions. And he's so problem with him, he, he's for a lot of his career, he's been a negative on offense where he's always been a double digit scorer, but the efficiency just hasn't been there. He's been a sub 40% th- uh, field goal shooter throughout his career. And while he's not quite the guy that he wasn't pit in terms of, all right, I got to be the number one option. Now he is taking advantage of the opportunities that he's given and he's knocking down jumpers. Like I, there was a play there where he got a wide open uh, catch and shoot three from the corner uh, against Ohio state, missed it then got it back and hit like a step back three off the dribble and, and just absolutely buried it. Um, so it's like, well, man, if you're hitting that, then Nebraska is going to have a good shot. So offensively he's not putting up, big point totals, but he's being a plus player on offense out there and taking advantage of his opportunities. And then defensively, he is absolutely setting the tone, making all the hustle plays, making life difficult for the opposing wings. And we talked about the Ohio State game. You had Trey to throw at Branham to slow him down during that game. Nebraska probably has a good shot to hold on to that lead that they had built up. Um, They just, down the stretch, they couldn't find anybody to stay in front of him and he hit some big shots. Um, And we saw it. 35 in the first game without him, 16 uh, on sub 50% shooting with him. Um, So he's really has kind of been the guy setting the tone on defense. And that has made a a huge deal coupled with how efficient he's been on offense in his opportunities. I also just, and then also, you know, I think we can't think this can't go unmentioned. I think the impact of him getting to him being on the court with Bryce, Um, you can tell by Bryce's, um, just by his body language, um, the way that, you know, he, he looks out there, you know, as someone who studied uh, communications at, uh, at in college, just the nonverbals, the body language, how he reacts to calls, plays. You can see a little, you know, you can see a little pep in his step, especially, you know, since Trey's been back, you know, they've both talked openly about, you know, Bryce is here because he wanted to play with Trey that, Obviously, did not go according to plan this year with you know the foot injury, but you know when they you know that it, and your story at the start of the year, man, like just you know this is this is what they this is what they they wanted. They've been dreaming of this since they were since they were kids, and they're making the most of it. You know, in the home stretch of the season, um, and it's and it's been great to see. Yeah. So. So make an impact in all three phases, offense, defense, and the vibes. It's yep, just a happy place there with a Trey back and a big part of it and kind of settled in. Um, so we've, we got a couple of variations of this. Uh, David McGee, I see this one here. Here's what I want to know. What the heck? Uh, well, um, I guess we kind of answered that uh, in the last – I think, uh, I, th- I think we can just answer this with uh, with a with a basketball coach speak cliche that I have been uh, harping on since episode one, and that is you got to make shots to win at this level. Um, I know I and I that was a question that I was going to ask you. You know when we started, it was how much of this can be credited to simply making shots, and how much of this is is everything else because a large, a large portion of it is simply shot making and the positive effect on psyche that making shots can have. Yes. uh, That's a very good point. And it's something that uh, I I kind of forgot to mention as we were going the game by game in the Penn state game, shots kept falling the entire night. They never stopped falling. You had a great stretch. Everybody's feeling good. Um, You shot lights out in the first half, went in the second half, Kept shooting lights out, had a had a chance to just feel great about yourself as a team. Everything you were doing was working. Carry that over into the next game. First half, shots keep falling. You hit a bunch of threes again. Second half, the shots stopped falling. Yet, 
now you had you, they had three straight halves of really quality basketball under their belts, and they found a way to persevere through that adversity of the shots not falling anymore. They were only three of eleven from three in the second half, but they got to the rim. We, we talked about the stretch that uh, that Verge had. Uh, Bryce was still kind of getting some buckets there, and then they defended. They held Ohio State under forty percent from the field in, in the second half, and so through that uh, that Penn State game where shots f- fell the entire game, everything you tried worked. You're able to build up some confidence, feel good, so that when you finally did run into some uh, adversity, they're able to persevere and find other ways to win because they're like, no, we can do this. We can go win this game. Uh, it wasn't just a matter of them shooting ridiculously from three. They went out and outplayed Ohio State in multiple areas of that game. Absolutely. Um, this comes from uh, the one, the only uh, producer, Josh, of the Connor Happer Show. <laughs> now that they're hot and on a heater, who will Nebraska beat in the Big Ten Championship to punch their ticket to the big dance? <laughs> Um, that's, um, it's a fun, uh, a fun hypothetical. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't see momentum, uh, carrying them that far. Um, I think if the season ended today, if they were to win two, I think they'd face Illinois, who in my opinion is the team that at full strength scares me the most in the big 10. So that probably would not end well for Nebraska. Um, yeah, I think they're on track. I think if the season ended right now, they'd open with Maryland and then they'd play six seed and then the three seed. Yes. And then the two seed. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, yeah. So they'd open with Maryland and then they would play. Yeah. And then they would play one, two, three, four, five, and then they'd play Rutgers and then, then they'd then they'd see Illinois. So Rutgers tonight, in what some were referring to as a uh, NCAA tournament elimination game, Ron Harper hits another highlight reel game winner at Assembly Hall. Um, thoughts and prayers to Mike Woodson and the Hoosiers. Um, I might have sang their prayers, their praises a little too hard start of the year, but. Um, yeah, they're not going to win the Big Ten. It's funny to think about. It would be an all-time would be an all-time run to go on. Um, I want to say stranger things have happened, but they haven't. That doesn't exactly apply here. <laughs> but still, still funny. Still funny to think about. Um, this kind of goes back to what I said about shots. Um, This is from an account that does not have a name. His name is Everything's Amazing. Go Big Red. Uh, What, in your opinion, has been the biggest catalyst for change? I think it's a combination of two things. I think it's it's two things we've talked about. We talked about shot making already, and I think I think it's I think it's Verge. I think it's Verge's play. Um, The point guard, the point guard position in, in on any team matters, but on in Fred Hoiberg's system at this level, it matters a lot. Um, You consistently hear him making reference to, in my opinion, chasing the ghost of Monte Morris. Um, He's not walking through that door anytime soon, or at least he hasn't at Nebraska to this point. Um, But as someone who liked watching Fred Hoiberg's Iowa state team so much, I almost went to college there just because of it. Um, (laughs) I, I, I have seen the, 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 you know, what a point guard means to, you know, the Fred Hoiberg system. And when, and I don't think they, I mean, they shot the lights out of Penn state. They might've won that game without verge, but I don't think they win last night without him. And um, just uh, like we, like we've said already, the up and down season he's had, he's still, fourth in the country in assist rate per Ken Palm, which is wildly impressive. Uh, moving up the chart for um, assists in a assists in a single season at Nebraska. He's, he's catching up to another uh, Hoiberg era favorite Cam Mack, who's just a couple spots ahead of him. <laughs> but um, I think it's a combination of, of making shots and just the, and getting a big plus from the point guard position. Yeah. And um, so 
Verge is a huge part of it. And then, like I said, Trey, too, and the way that he's settled in and the impact he's made defensively. Over, over the last two games, they're giving up 70 points a game, uh, holding teams to 43% shooting, 32% from three. So, um, I mean, it's not – they're not absolutely locking down, but you look at that Penn State team and their ball screen coverages. Um, they were on the same page. You had guys hedging, guys helping the helper. Um, the guard and the big were on the same page. Just little things that give you a chance to have success on defense and get some stops. And I think that that starts with Trey and the, the pressure that he's uh, able to provide at the point of attack. I mean, and they've been mixing up their defenses too. There's been a little bit of a kind of a matchup two three type of deal we've seen. There's been some one three one mix in there where um, you've got Trey kind of harassing the ball handler coming down the court. And in that Ohio State game, he straight up picked the ball. I think it was from Jamari Wheeler at, at one point where they, they went into that one three one, and Trey was picking up full court, um, harassing him all the way down the uh, down uh, into the, the front court and ended up just taking the ball away from him. So you, you've got that, that point of attack defense that they were missing for much of the season, and then everybody else kind of sit, uh, playing on the same page behind that. So shots falling. Uh, Good, better decision making from the guys uh, running the offense, and, and then defensive effort has been better, more consistent, and more cohesive. Uh, you've had more guys on the same page defensively, and the result is back to back wins uh, on the road. Yep, absolutely. Um, that we kind of covered the rest of the questions that. Uh, uh-huh. Got to ask pertaining to basketball. Um, uh, the Johnny Pig, John Livingston, uh, how did you make it this far? And the answer is, well, I've been covering this program for seven seasons now. So uh, uh, the, ans- the answer for, yeah, the answer for me is I have been a part of this before. <laughs> um, I know, I know what uh, losing a lot of games in the Big Ten feels like firsthand. Um, so, uh, Watching it and talking about it is is uh, a lot <laughs> is a little little easier than uh, than first firsthand experience. Um, so that's that's how we're here. Well, it's nothing it's nothing we haven't seen before. As crazy as that may sound, but uh, we 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 know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yep. And uh, also, uh, I, I can always fall back on my Phoenix Suns um, when I need a fix of good winning basketball. Uh, hasn't always been the case throughout this time that I've been covering the Huskers, but these last two years, for sure, uh, the Suns have always been there as a pick-me-up uh, as they absolutely drubbed Portland uh, while we record uh, without Devin Booker and Chris Paul. Um, so that that's that's kind of the other key is find other ways to enjoy the sport uh even if you don't always get to while you're doing your job absolutely no absolutely yeah i think i I think i might be going to my first nba game in a couple weeks kind of wild that i haven't been to one but really i'm gonna i think i'm gonna try and make it to uh celtics nuggets while i'm out in denver in a couple weekends so like yeah like you said find other ways to enjoy basketball no matter the level it's state tournament week next week you know all sorts of all sorts of all sorts of other other outlets to enjoy this uh, sport speaking of the nba uh, i think a certain former husker uh, in the nba uh, deserves a shout out for what he did on wednesday night absolutely um someone that i was lucky enough to spend uh, three years working with and someone that i still consider a friend career night for isaiah roby um he the thunder get a get a road win 119 to 107 in denver tonight and uh Isaiah finishes with a career high 26 points, uh, seven rebounds and five assists, nine of 13 shooting four or five from three. Um, that is, that's pretty dang impressive. Uh, he started the, the thunder posted a bunch of highlights of him going at raining, you know, MVP, Nikola Jokic, uh, defending him well, attacking him well on offense and, um, like you, like you said before we recorded this, of course he winds up on one of the three teams that's that's blacked out here, so it's it's hard to see Thunder games. But um, and you know it's been a been quite the NBA journey for Roby. Um, you know he was a second round pick, and within within a year of getting a 
close to record breaking second round pick contract from Dallas. They traded him for a guy they wound up cutting in Justin Patton. And, um, but he's found, he's found a niche in Oklahoma city with a role and whatever they're doing with their rotations. They're clearly in a, in a rebuild. They have all the draft capital in the world, but they've kept him around through everything. And he's, he's shown that, uh, that he, that he can belong and has a role. So, I'm, I'm through the roof, happy for him, uh, salt of the earth guy. And obviously it's good to see former Huskers uh, thriving at the next level. <laughs> yeah, nothing but great things to say about Isaiah Roby uh, <clears throat> in my time covering him and just being around him and um, happy to see him having success. And he's kind of a testament to stay ready. Um, you mentioned kind of the, the state of the thunder and they're rebuilding. They've got a lot of young pieces, a lot of young players that are maybe not necessarily similar, but play similar positions. You got a Darius Baisley and Alexi Pokashevsky, Jeremiah Robinson Earl. You've got vets like Mike Muscala and what Derek Favors. Um, they, so they, they've kind of been changing up their, uh, uh, their rotation all season. Uh, and for stretches, Isaiah's been starting. Other stretches, he hasn't played at all. But he's come ready to play when, when they call his number in uh, – kind of culminated into a career high uh, game tonight against uh, one of the best players in the league. So shout out to Roby. Um, wanted to make sure we squeeze that in. The next time we talk to you, will uh, either Nebraska will be Big Ten tournament champions or their season will be over. Um, <laughs> we, we're going to have to play it by year in terms of when we record next week because I've got state tournament coverage. Um, and that leads right into the, uh, summer basketball tryouts on that Sunday. So we'll have to find a time where we can squeeze in a recording to kind of wrap up whatever happens at, at the big 10 tournament. But, um, we will definitely do that. And, um, the episode will hit your, hit your feeds once, uh, we figure that out. Any, any Absolutely. last uh, thoughts here, Bigelow, as we kind of close this thing out? Uh, not nothing, nothing earth shattering, but, uh, it's, it's, it's good to have a change in terms of, of things to talk about. Um, especially after last week, when you, when I said that you, a person who gets paid to think of words to describe this team was running out of them. Uh, it's good to, um, see, see some positivity, see a couple W's. Like I said, see those guys celebrating in the locker room and, um, one more, you know, at, at, two more games at the, at the least. And uh, we will be through with this Nebraska basketball season. And uh, the next time you hear from us, we'll be putting a bow on the season. All right. In, in the meantime, uh, follow me on Twitter at Jacob Badilla underscore follow Bigelow at the underscore Bigelow read everything uh, at hillvarsity.com. Um, subscribe to the, the magazine. If you haven't um, subscribe to this podcast, uh, rate and review it, um, recommend it to a friend, um, we, we'd love to grow this thing. We'll, this was a fun episode. We actually got to talk about good things. So hopefully you enjoyed listening to it. And we will be back again next week. A Huda Media Production.